Amen. Brothers and sisters, I ask you to open your Bibles in Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, and we are going to read from verse 24 through 29. Colossians chapter 1, verses 24 through 29. Let us read the Word of God with faith. Thus says the Word of the Lord, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up what is lacking Christ's afflictions. Of this church... I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit, so that I might fully carry, carry out the preaching of the word of God. That is, the, that, is, that is the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and generations, but has now been manifested to the saints, to whom God willed, to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We proclaim him, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom, so that we may present every man complete in Christ. For this purpose I also labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. Let us seek again our Lord in a prayer for illumination. Father, as we read from your word, help us, Lord, to see Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord, to, to learn more about Jesus Lord, give us faith and understanding. We pray all these in Jesus' name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, according to the scriptures, uh, to be a minister of the gospel is the highest calling on earth. As the late R.C. Pro once said, God had only one son and he made him a preacher. However, what does it mean to be a minister of the gospel? And how to determine what is an authentic ministry that is pleasing to God? These are questions that you should ask, not only uh, ask yourselves, not only when you are looking for a church to become a member, if you move to another state or city, but it is a question that you should keep asking yourselves throughout your life your lives. And brothers and sisters, we know by the context of the letter to the Colossians that the Apostle Paul, he did not plant the church at Colossae. It was a man called Epaphras. So the Apostle Paul had nev never seen the Christians at Colossae face to face. When he received a report from Epaphras, about this church, he sent them the letter that we have before us this morning, the letter to the Colossians. Now, it seems that the false teachers at Colossae, they were uh, not only attacking the message of the gospel, but they were also attacking Paul's ministry as an apostle. Therefore, from verses 24 to 29, the apostle gives the Colossians one of the richest, richest, and most substantial passage about the nature and the purpose of the Christian ministry, about the nature and the purpose of the Christian ministry. In other words, he sets the standards and the benchmarks of what con constitutes a ministry pleasing to God. Of course, it also gives you 
this morning is standards to judge and to test who is a true ministry of the gospel today. So, from Colossians chapter 1, verses 24 through 29, we are going to see that the ministers of the gospel are called to suffer for Christ and his church by being stewards of the message of the gospel and by making believers mature in Christ. In other words, you, brothers and sisters, you are called to suffer for Christ by being faithful stewards of the gospel and by making your fellow Christians mature in him. And we are going to see these under three headings. And you have those uh, in your bulletins. First, the calling of the ministry in verse 24. Second, the work of the ministry from verses 25 through 27. And third, the goal of the ministry, the minister, verses 28 and 29. The calling, the work, and the goal. Paul begins here our section this morning by describing the calling of the minister. And he says that this calling entails suffering. The calling to the ministry entails suffering. He says in verse 24, please read with me, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. So, brothers and sisters, despite all the hardships, despite all the pain, despite all the life-threatening experience that the apostle uh, might have gone through, he says that he rejoices. But how? How can someone rejoice in the midst of suffering? He rejoices because he learned to rejoice in the Lord always. He writes to the Philippians. And he learned to rejoice, uh, rejoice in the Lord always because he knew he should not be anxious about anything. For God is preserving and governing all his creatures and all their action, actions in the most powerful, wise, and, and, and holy way. Well, the Apostle Paul also rejoices because he loves uh, Christ's church and its people. He says in chapter 2, verse 1, that although he had never met the Colossians face to face, he said that he had never... Uh, he was enduring a great struggle for them. A great struggle for them. Because he loved the Colossians. There was nothing that a, the Apostle Paul wouldn't do for them. No trial the Apostle wouldn't endure for them. No burden that he wouldn't bear for them. If by doing so, he would uh, be sure that he might be a blessing to them. So he rejoices, even in the midst of, of all the pain and the sufferings and the hardships that he was going through. But the apostle continues in verse 24. Please look at, uh, look at verse 24 with me again. And in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's affliction for the sake of his body, that is the church. So the first question you should, ask, you should be asking yourselves this. What does filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions mean? Well, we can first of all rule, rule out what it doesn't mean. Paul doesn't say here, Paul, Paul doesn't mean that Christ's death on the cross was insufficient in any way. Actually, the main theme of the letter to the Colossians is that Jesus Christ is supreme. Jesus Christ is superior. Jesus Christ is sufficient for our salvation. 
That is the main theme to the letter, uh, of the letter to the Colossians. Jesus Christ is sufficient and superior. Therefore, brothers and sisters, there is nothing that the Colossians could do to add to what Christ had done for them already on the cross. Nothing. So then, what does Paul mean? What does Paul mean, Paul mean here in verse 24? Well, if you are familiar with the Colossians letter, you know that in verse 18, the Apostle Paul stated that Jesus Christ is the head of the body, the church. And now he is he reinforces this idea, the same idea here in verse 24, saying that his sufferings were for the sake of his body, that is the church of wheat, this church, I was made a minister. Brothers and sisters, Paul is using here a metaphor that he often uses throughout his letter to teach uh, his letters to teach his readers about the reality of their union with Jesus Christ. And Christ's spiritual headship over them. So we read, for instance, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 26 and 27, we, we read the Apostle Paul writing this, If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ, and individually members of it. And the idea that, that Paul is teaching here in 1 Corinthians and in, in, in Colossians is, is that once they were united to Jesus Christ by the Spirit, if they suffered persecution in Jesus Christ's namesake, the spiritual head of the spiritual body also shared spiritually in their affliction. If they, they suffered persecution in Jesus' name's sake, the spiritual head of the spiritual body, the church, also suffered, shared spiritually in their affliction. And brothers and sisters, if you remember... Uh, when the resurrected Christ appeared to Paul in his way to Damascus in Acts chapter 9, what did, what did Jesus say to Paul? Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? But notice that Jesus, at that point, he was already in glory. And Paul was not persecuting Jesus. Paul was persecuting but Jesus says why are you persecuting me so you see how Paul teach, uh, is teaching here the Colossians and you this morning that Jesus Christ he identifies himself so closely with his people that when they suffer persecution in his name he mysteriously and spiritually suffers with them. There is a connection, there is a bond between Christ and us, Christ and His church, that is stronger than anything in the world. And nothing can break it. Nothing can break this connection, this bond. Okay, so what? How can you apply all these truths in your life this morning? First, when your pastor and I felt the calling to the ministry, we knew that it was a calling to suffer. You know, brothers and sisters, that your pastor suffer, suffers in his studies, in his counseling, in his prayers, and even tears for you and for all the other members of this church. 
Your pastor was called to suffer for your sake. And even if necessary, he was called to suffer in his own flesh on behalf of the church of Jesus Christ. So pray for him. Pray constantly that God would give you past, uh, you pastors and elders here present. Pray that God may give you a heart that beats with love for God's people. So even in the midst of your suffering, your trials, your pains, you may witness about Jesus Christ. You may point all the brothers and sisters that are here present to the Lord himself. But pray for your pastor. As he would gladly bear any cause, any trials, if in doing so he would promote your welfare in Jesus Christ. Second, Jesus Christ is the head of the body, as we saw in verse 24. That is the church. And you have been united to him by the Holy Spirit. And we saw that this bond, this connection is unbreakable. Doesn't this reality make you want to stop everything that you are doing and praise and, and, and give glory to your Lord Jesus Christ. Does, doesn't this reality, reality make, make you want to love him even more this morning? Doesn't this reality uh, make you to love his church even more? But when you are facing opposition, when you are suffering during your daily struggles, your daily life, remember Colossians chapter 1, Verse 25, rejoice in your suffering for Christ's sake when you are facing persecution. And remember that he promised you to be with you until the end. He promised you to be with you and he is with you this morning. So brothers and sisters, we, first the apostle taught the Colossians about the calling of the minister. And it can be applied to our own calling. And now he goes on to teach then about the work of the minister in verses 25 through 27. And the question you might be asking yourselves is, what exactly is it a minister is called to do? So in verse 25, Paul says to the Colossians, please read with me, of which I, the church, this church, I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you. So the first work of the minister is to be a steward of God's people. That is the first work of the minister, to be a steward of God's people. And remember that a steward in Paul's days was a slave working in the household who was entrusted with the daily necessities of the family. He was entrusted to provide, to, to, to ensure the provision, that provision was made day by day for the welfare of the household. So, brothers and sisters, the steward, he was not the master. The steward was a slave. He was a slave under the orders of the master of the house. Thus, Paul is saying to the Colossians, thus, Paul is saying to the Colossians here that Christ is the head of the household. The minister is the steward. And the household is is the family of God, the church of Jesus Christ. It is us. As he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, the apostle says this, this is how you should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required. 
part of stewards that they be found faithful. Therefore, the minister of the gospel should, uh, should be a faithful steward that obeys the order of the master, Jesus Christ, and be sure that provision has been made to the household daily for the welfare of the household. But the question that we should ask is, faithful in what? The, the minister should be a faithful steward, but faithful in what? A steward of what? Look at verse 25 with me again. It says, to make the word of God fully known. And that is the second work of the ministry. The minister, it is to preach the gospel faithfully. It is to preach the gospel faithfully. Here is the faithful work of the ministry. He is the work that God prepared your pastor and is preparing me. As I finished seminary and I'm going through a year-long internship at Grace Orthodox Presbyterian Church in Fair Law. Here is how God is preparing us by sending us to seminary to, to, to equip us to make the word of God fully known to Christ's church. Of course, and we know that, that administration, wisdom, empathy, pastoral care, all those things are important to a pastor and to a ministry, to an elder. But one thing that is essential to, the, to a minister of the gospel is to faithfully preach the word of God. Is to faithfully preach the word of God. And then Paul goes on in verses 26 and 27 to describe, to characterize the content of the word that the minister should preach. So in verses 26 and 27, if you read with me, he says that the content of the message preached is this. The mystery hidden from age and generations, but now revealed to his sense. To then, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That is the message that the, the steward, the ministry, should be faithful to. And Paul uses the word mystery here to convey not a Pentecostal revelation as we so often hear nowadays. Paul, convey, Paul wants to convey here the idea of God's self-disclosure, God's self-revelation, God's revelation of His plan. This word uh, mystery is, is used in the scriptures to describe something that was formerly hidden and that is now being revealed. Something that was formerly hidden and now has been revealed. And the mystery that was hidden in the shadows of the Old Testament and now has been revealed and fully revealed in Jesus Christ is Christ in you, the hope of glory. In other words, brothers and sisters, the plan that God, uh, for the world and for the elect, that God had kept hidden from ages and generations, that plan now has been fully realized and fully revealed in the person, in the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it has been applied to the Colossians and to you by the Holy Spirit. By your union with your Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ in you means that you are united to him. Brothers, here is the heartbeat of the gospel. Here is the heartbeat of all Paul's letters. And the question you should ask yourself this morning is, what do you get in the gospel? What do you get in the gospel? 
Brothers and sisters, it's not just about forgiveness. It is not just about reconciliation to God. It is not just about a clean conscience. It is not about just about sanctification, about glorification, about adoption. When you get the gospel, you get a person. You get Jesus Christ himself. And with Christ, you receive everything that he conquered on the cross for us. But you get him. Jesus Christ in you. That is your hope of glory. The reality of the Christian union with Jesus Christ by grace through faith is such that the apostle describes this reality in Romans chapter 8 and here in Colossians chapter 1 as the riches, the riches of this mystery. The riches of this mystery. Brothers, what do you expect from your pastor? Maybe sometimes you hear some celebrity pastor uh, on radio or on YouTube. And you think, he is, a good, he is a good pastor. He is a good pastor. What a preaching. What a sermon. Well, he may be a good pastor and maybe you will never know because you will never talk to him or be his sheep. But I say one thing for sure to you this morning. God has called your pastor and placed him to be his steward at this church. He has been faithful to his calling and faithful to the word of his master, Jesus Christ. He has suffered for you. He has prayed for you. He has given up his time with his family to Help you and your family. So the question this morning is, how are, how, how are you treating your pastor? Do you pray for him? Do you care for him and for his family? Do you show patience toward him? Have you ever encouraged him? How? The same applies to your elders. Do you pray for your elders? Do you encourage them? Do you care for their families? Moreover, brothers and sisters, Paul says that the mystery of the gospel is Jesus Christ in you. So, how has this mystery changed your life? How has this mystery changed you as a Christian, as a husband, a wife, a father, a mother, a son, a daughter, a student. God's plan from the beginning was to redeem you in such a way that Jesus Christ would be present with you and in you every day of your life until the end. So the question is, how has it made, it made you different. Do you cultivate your relationship with Jesus daily? Do you culti cultivate godly friendships and godly conversations? Have you, have you made uh, good use of the means of grace? How is your prayer life? Do you read the scriptures constantly? Do you meditate upon his word day and night, as the psalmist says in Psalm number one? Do you partake faithfully of the sacraments? Do you enjoy having fellowship with your brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ in you is the hope of glory. 
Paul says to the Ephesians that the world without Christ, in the world, there is no hope. Jesus Christ is our only hope. Jesus Christ is our only hope. As Jeremiah writes to in Lamentations, we need constantly remember ourselves of this truth. He said that we should bring to our minds what gives us hope. And Jesus Christ is our hope. So bring to your mind through the means of grace. The means that God chose to strengthen and to build up our faith in Him. To build up our relationship with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Use them. It is not late for you to begin using those means of grace. So, brothers and sisters, after talking about the calling and the work of the minister, the apostle goes on to state the goal of the minister in verses 28 and 29. The goal of the minister. And he says, Him we proclaim. Notice how, how the Greek here is so emphatic. The Greek here is really emphatic. The Apostle Paul is emphatically teaching to the Colossians that the first goal of the minister is to proclaim Jesus Christ. Is to proclaim Jesus Christ. Paul says elsewhere, that for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Well, of course that doesn't mean that Paul only had one sermon and he kept preaching it over and over again. It means that no matter which subject Paul needed to deal with, Lawsuits. If you read the letter to the Corinthians, you will get a grasp of how many things Paul needed to deal with in that church. Lawsuits, immorality, divisions in the church, chaotic worship, and so much else. And in everything that he needed to deal with, he did it in the light of who Jesus is, what he has done for us on the cross, and what it means to follow him. In other words, Paul's ministry life was Christ-centered. And he's telling the Colossians that their lives should be Christ-centered as well. So whatever you are dealing with in your life, at work, in your family, at church. If you are an elder, an elder, a deacon, or a member of this church, whatever you are dealing with, whatever questions you need to ask, answer, the answer is found in Jesus Christ. A Christ-centered life provides the answer that you need. And the Apostle Paul continues saying in verse 28, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Therefore, brothers and sisters, the Apostle teaches the Colossians that the second goal of the ministry, the minister, is to apply the word of God to his people in order to make them mature in Christ. To apply the word of God to his people in order to make them mature in Jesus Christ. And the pastor and the elders, and, and you as Christians, when you are talking to any other fellow believer, you should teach the whole counsel of God. And give, and, and the pastor especially, 
He, he needs to be concerned to give his sheep, Jesus' sheep, tools to apply this knowledge, the knowledge of the scriptures, to their daily lives in such a way that they will glorify our Lord Jesus Christ every day in all respects, as the Paul says to the Colossians earlier in this letter. So that the Christian would grow mature in his faith. And they would not be moved by any machinations of hell, as John Calvin likes to say in his commentary. That is to be mature in Jesus Christ, not only to apply the word of God to your life, but also not be moved by any machinations of hell. That is to be mature, a mature Christian. So the apostle finishes in verse 29 saying, please read with me, for this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. So brothers, the third goal of the minister is to depend on upon God's powerful work in his life. And Paul defines this toil as a struggling. As such, he was in a wrestling match. And he says that he's only able to continue to fight the, his enemy because he has been sustained by God's energy that works powerfully within him which conveys the idea that God powerfully works, sustains, keeps, and enables His servants to stay there under suffering and remain faithful. The pastor, the elder, Paul says, and you, We'll face many struggles for God's people, for one another. The pastor especially, he will try to help them and sometimes he will not succeed. He will pray for a revival in the church and appar apparently do not see any result. He will sometimes face opposition from the, some people at church. It happens so often. People will always expect more from him, even though sometimes he's doing everything that he can. Therefore, the ministry of the gospel must depend upon only upon God's power working within them. And this energy is more powerful than any energy drink or pill because it enables the minister to rejoice even in the midst of his suffering. Brothers, to proclaim Jesus Christ, to teach Christians, as we saw, to be mature Christians in Jesus. Now, how often do you proclaim Jesus Christ in your life? This calling is primarily to the ministers of the gospel, but it is also to the Christians at Colossian. It is also for you this morning. So how often do you proclaim Jesus Christ in your life? Is making other Christians to be mature in Jesus a priority in your life? Do you talk about Jesus? Do you talk about Jesus as Moses wrote in Deuteronomy chapter 6? Do you talk about Jesus when, when you wake up, when you are walking, when you are at work, when you are at school children? When you are with your friends. When you are going to sleep. When you are with your family. Do you talk about Jesus? Today we have the idea that we can be Christians only by example. We do not need to talk about Jesus. Well, we do. We do. Because faith comes from hearing and hearing the word of God. Ordinarily through the preaching of the word. But also when we communicate the gospel, we show people 
who Jesus Christ is, what He has done for us in the cross, and how did it makes our life differently. We want to live differently because of what He has done for us. And He's doing our life. Or are, are you always waiting for your pastor? You see something wrong that must be addressed at church, but you are always waiting for someone else. Well, if you are called to the ministry, as I was, or if you are called to be a Christian, it is a calling also, Paul says to the Ephesians. You must aim for the goals the apostle sets before you this morning here in Colossians chapter 1, verses 24 through 29. You must aim to live a life as the apostle is portraying here also. Besides, you know that you will suffer persecution and trials for Jesus' name. Jesus himself told his disciples that if he suffered persecution, the disciples would also suffer persecution in his name's sake. Paul is not introducing here anything new. We already know that. The Colossians already knew that. Maybe you have been uh, persecuted at work. Maybe you have been persecuted at, at school. Or even at home. And you feel discouraged sometimes. The good news for you this morning is come to God in prayer. And ask Him to teach you to depend upon His powerful energy. You see, it does not depend on your own strength. Ask God so that He can fill you with this powerful energy that works within the creation. And to enable you to pers persevere until the end. Even in the midst of your trials. Even in the midst of your pain. I was talking uh, the past week with a friend of mine. He is the registrar, registrar uh, at our seminary in Greenville, South Carolina. And he's, she's, she just found out that she has a stage 4 cancer. And there is no treatment. When I called her, I could feel she was sad. She's, a, she's young. But I could see that she was rejoicing the Lord. She pointed me to Jesus Christ all the time throughout our conversation. What a blessing to be able to witness about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, about the riches of the mystery of the gospel, even in the midst of our most difficult times. If you think that you do not have that, you are not strong enough, that is the bad news for you. Yes, you are not. But Paul is teaching you that if you pray and you ask, God is powerful enough to give you all the energy that you need to keep struggling. And Jesus Christ, he was already victorious. And in him, you does not need to fear anything. Brothers and sisters, I asked you in the beginning, what does it mean to be a minister of the gospel? And you learned that it means to be called by God to suffer for God's people and yet rejoice in the midst of your sufferings. The work of the ministry involves being a faithful steward of God and to preach the mystery of the gospel that Christ is in all those who believe in him for salvation. Then we saw that the goal of the ministry is to proclaim Jesus Christ, preaching and teaching our fellow brothers and sisters to be mature in Jesus Christ and to be mature 
as we saw, is to be able to apply the knowledge of the Scriptures to our daily life and not be moved by any machinations of hell. And all this is possible not because the ministry is, is strong by himself, nor because you are strong by yourself, but because the ministry, the Christian, learn, the Christian learns to depend upon the powerful energy that God alone works and can work within them. We praise the Lord for giving us faithful ministers, faithful elders of the gospel in our country, in our denominations, and especially in our church, Pompton Plain, Reformed Bible Church, and also in Grace, at Grace, Orthodox Presbyterian Church. Please, pray with me.